welcome. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. Okay. Well, Juru runs an org, or helped create an organization called Catalyst 2030, which is an NGO of NGOs. And I, I, she just, she, her group just recently released a report, uh, Getting from Crisis to Systems Change. And if you will indulge me, Drew, I want to read a couple of quick lines from the executive summary of that because it's, it's so powerful stuff. And I think it helps explain what you're doing, why we wanted you here. It says, even before this crisis, normal wasn't working. Normal was an unjust, unequal, and unsustainable world whose deep flaws contributed directly to the spread of the COVID-19 pandemic and to the extraordinarily high social and economic cost of containing it. Normal was a situation in which only five years after the governments of 193 countries committed to achieve by 2030, the UN Sustainable Development Goals, we were already decades behind schedule to fulfill that vision of a just, inclusive, and environmentally healthy world. That to me is so critical to keep in mind. But what I want you quickly to tell us a little bit about you, your background. You've had an extraordinary life as an activist and uh, you're obviously an incredibly effective organizer. Um, and, and so tell us what you've done and why you focused in on the SDGs particularly. Yeah. So I'd like to start with why did I choose the SDGs? Um, what does everyone whom I'm talking to here really want? You basically want to have food on the table, a nice life, a roof over your head, right? And some clothes to wear. Yet, a large chunk of the world's population doesn't get that. So my passion for being with the SDGs is trying to make sure that everybody has the same things that I am blessed to have, that everyone who's listening on this uh, Zoom call has. So I don't think we can really say SDGs is for the marginalized SDGs is for all of us because if we don't have good drinking water, if we don't have clean air, you know, we will not be able to survive very long. So the SDGs to me is for everybody and every person on the planet, but I think it's much more for the people who are poor, for people who are living in the marginalized on the fringes of society. And that's why it's my passion. Good. I, but, but no, so, just give us a quick yeah. summary of your background, though. I mean, you, you've done so much. Um, my background. Okay. I'm a, I was qualified as a social worker, and I thought that was not enough. So I studied management, and actually that was in New York, where I understand most of the people from this group are from, at the New School of Social Research. And one of the early influences in my career was when, while studying in New York, I worked with homeless men in New York. And I actually was shocked at the level of inequalities of income in uh, what was there and how the homeless men lived, which got me to, and what I did while working for the Coalition for the Homeless was actually start a helpline so the homeless men could call whenever necessary to get into night shelters or food or whatever, along with the night rounds that we did at the Coalition. So when I went back to India, I said, it worked in America. Let's see if we can do something like that in India. And I used to work with street kids and uh, started something called Childline India, and, uh, uh, which was a toll-free number, which started, was started by street kids for street kids. Then, um, uh, and today Childline responds to around 15 million phone calls, then fell in love, moved to the Netherlands, and... Uh, had committed to taking helplines across the world. So started Child Helpline International. And uh, we, in three years, were able to start helplines in 130 countries, oh. uh, drawing from the models of some of the European helplines. So sort of instead of trying to reinvent the wheel, building from the experiences. And I have to say, I know Jim Fruchtman is on the attendee list on this call. And now I'm doing something with Jim on a project which Jim is leading because he's the tech guru, not me. And we are trying to see how to create a call response center, which includes WhatsApp, text, calling, everything, so we can respond to children at a faster rate. So that's one trajectory. But as I was working with street children, I also started, uh, we realized that street kids used to earn money, but they spent it all and they had no financial knowledge. 
So the simplest thing was started with uh, teaching them financial education and believing in themselves. That led to another organization called Aflatoon, etc. And that moved on. So this is a bit about me. And the last organization is Catalyst, but I think we'll talk more about that later, right? Yes. Well, we should go right into that now, because the thing that I, I found so fascinating in, in reading the report and thinking about the work you're doing is that you, 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 one of the key points is that a, a system for integrating the insights and the experience of NGOs into policymaking really doesn't exist. And that's one of the key things you're trying to create, particularly around the SDGs and particularly working with the UN. And one of the things that I was really interested in was that, you know, the UN, for all of its virtues, doesn't really have a piece devoted to intersecting with this huge part of the world that is so parallel to many of the UN's own projects. So talk about that and, and how it's going. Yeah. So, uh, Many social entrepreneurs are looking at several issues, but they don't really have access to the UN, like you said. So what we did is when we put this report together, we said we had three main asks. One was that the UN have a focal point with whom social entrepreneurs could interact, because that's half the battle. If you know where to go, then you're able to. So when we launched this report, we launched it with Amina Mohammed, And that was the main ask that we had to her. We said, create a special... She's under Secretary General of the UN, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Sorry. I mean, I'm a, and she's in charge of the SDGs. Right. Her main portfolio is that. Right. So we asked her to create a special envoy for social entrepreneurs so we could expedite the process. And I think... And she did. Uh, she did well. She's thinking about it, and she said she'll get back to us. So we are going to keep pushing to make that happen for sure. But she was positive. Well, the thing also that's really interesting that you articulate so well in the report, which I think our friend Matthew Bishop helped write, by the way, if I can just. Oh, Matthew say, wrote it. Matthew, Matthew wrote it is fully. A great friend of Techonomy. He's moderated for us. I, I hope he's watching. He may not be, but uh, the point though was that the N the NGOs actually are the ones who understand the problems. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Because they're working in the trenches with all these issues day to day with the people, you know, that are really suffering, the, the, it, whether it's education or health or poverty. Right. I mean, talk a little more about what 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 is the I mean, I, I just want to I feel like you've 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 kind of arrived at a key insight and you've made a key organizational uh, victory just in bringing all these groups together. Uh, and I don't think most people even realize the problem was there before. That makes me sad, but uh, yeah, I do think you, uh, it makes me sad, but it's true. Uh, most people, the sector realized we had a problem because we realized we were hitting a glass ceiling and we could not scale the way we wanted to because nobody really gave us the recognition for all the work we are doing. Even now with COVID, who was at the front lines? It was... Of course, it was the medical teams, but it was really civil society out there being with the people, social entrepreneurs at the front lines. Yet they never, ever actually got recognized. And the story behind our report is actually that we first started saying we are doing all this work and our funding got cut or our funding was decreasing for social enterprises. So we said, what is this? The demand from the community is so high and the funding is really not coming in and that's when we said what is different why is this happening and then we said instead of talking about what we are doing why don't we all come together and write a joint report which tackles the root of the problem that is the ecosystem which doesn't work and then tackle how we can change the whole ecosystem especially the funding ecosystem and where do you think this effort is going to go what would you like to see it turn into what I'd like to see is that every one of the recommendations in that report, they get met. And a total, there are 140 plus recommendations. And we want to make sure all of them are met because if they are met, we can achieve the SDGs by 2030. If they are not met, we'll probably achieve them by 2094. And that is the current prediction by the Social Progress Index Initiative. Is that right? Oh, yep. that's such a bummer. 2094. Yeah. You know, one of the things that's interesting is, you know, we asked people which SDGs they were particularly passionate about. 
I'm impressed that one of the top three was the, 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 the SDG that gets no respect, which is the last one, partnerships to achieve the goals, which I remember in the early days when we were talking to people about the SDGs, uh, people said, why is that even there? But in fact, what you're underscoring is that may be the most central one to actually get results. Um, so having made that you know, comment, I, I would love to ask you, how is business doing? And how, do you also have a mandate and a goal and an a, 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 a effort with all of this organized sort of army of NGOs that you have assembled uh, to work with business as well? And, and how, how do you, how would you, what grade would you give business on, on the SDGs and working with NGOs? We think it's very important to work with business. As a matter of fact, uh, our report has recommendations on how business can contribute. And uh, there are different ways across the value chain. Technology companies, which is this main audience, can work with us to strengthen how we can deliver to the last mile or the first mile, whichever way you look at it. So if we can uh, to help create platforms where we can do information sharing. So a lot of our work needs support from business and we can actually help businesses too because we can help them make their value chain better. We have the expertise, not me, but the entrepreneurs in the network have the expertise to say how they can tackle their CO2 emissions, have the expertise to say what they can do with plastic waste. So business need to stop looking at us as just charity, but also look at us as people who have expertise. So it's a two way mutual process. We can use the expertise from business and they can use the expertise from us. And if we work together, hey, we can achieve much more. Is part of your goal to sort of serve as a, a hub to help make those connections? Yes, definitely. That's and what how, we are trying. So what should people on this call do? What, what can they do? There's a lot of business people represented here. What would you give us as our own marching orders just to end? Marching orders, simple. A, get in touch with us partner with our social entrepreneurs and try to make sure that you concretely work towards achieving the SDGs. Not a lot of talk, a lot of action. That's what we believe in Catalyst. And so let's co-create something. Catalyst2030.org is your URL. Is that right? Dot net. Dot net. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, no worries. Okay. Well, Jeru, thank you so much. Thank you for being with us in the evening. You're our second European expert on the SDGs who's joined us at night this, this day. So thank you so much. And we want to stay very closely in touch. And I hope you will hear from businesses that are represented here. And, uh, and Jim Fruchtman. I hope so too. Jim Fruchtman, by the way, who's a Techonomy member, put in the chat that the 2094 estimate was a pre-pandemic estimate. So it's probably even worse now, although maybe we feel more sense of urgency if we really take our optimistic gene from you. So thank you. Thank you very much. Pleasure to be there. And I hope some of you will get in touch and we can collaborate. Great. Thanks again, Jeru.